Good morning. It's good to see you. <laughs> wow, that was hilarious, actually. What I want to do before I really get started is I just want to I just want to give a thanks to the worship team, and I'm talking about all the props, the people who do plays, the people who sing. Can we just I'm thankful for them, man? So listen, if you weren't here last week, let me catch you up. We're in the middle, or we began a series called Hashtag Struggles. And what we're talking about is how we live in this world of technology that pretty much everything centers around it, right? And we have to figure out how to live for God and use technology. Because technology, if we're honest with each other, has impacted every part of our lives in the last 35, 40 years. It is just amazing how it is in every part of our lives. I mean, you can't get in a car without there being a little screen that you can watch a television now. And so we have to talk about this because it has impacted our life. And, and look, I could list out 25 ways right now that it has impacted our life for good. But there are some ways that it has caused negative impacts on our life, right? I mean, think about it. It's changed the way we work. Just think about how the jobs that we had that we didn't have 30 years ago because of technology. Think about how we do those jobs because we have technology, right? The way we communicate has changed drastically. Our relationships and how we go about doing those relationships have changed because of technology. School. I'm a former teacher, and when I was growing up, they gave encyclopedias and dictionaries. Ask a kid to look through an encyclopedia today. They will act like you're talking Spanish. It's changed. Even the hobbies. Back when I was a kid, a hobby was to go out and play basketball. Now kids are like, I'm training to become a professional video game player because they can make $2 million at a tournament. I'm like, wait a minute. I missed my calling. It's changed our lives, and so we have to talk about it. Matter of fact, one pastor said this. I was reading, and this pastor said that he had a really young church, and he said that the, the concept of the Holy Trinity, that when he talks about the Trinity, that they think he's talking about Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's kind of funny, but it's scary. Because if that's true for us, if, if, if really technology has become our God, because that's really what that means, if, if, if really technology has become the center of our lives, if we're chained to this thing, then there's no way we can live into what God has for us. There's no way that you can be content. Alan, Alan talked about being content and contentment last week. And, and that can only be found when God is, in God is the center of your life. And he talked about how Paul says, I have learned. It wasn't just dropped in my pocket. I learned, you know, how to be content. I learned to be content in any situation, whether I have two likes or 600. Okay, he didn't really say that, but y'all get what I'm saying. Whether I got 1,000 followers or I have zero, whether I got 100 views or I have none, I know that I'm found in my contentment and my value is found in God. See, but we can't have that if he's not our center. We can't have healthy relationships. We can't have compassion and be shown compassion. And we certainly will not be authentic. We won't be honest with ourselves without God helping us be honest. And so we have to talk about this. And this week I want to talk about relationships and how technology is impacting them. But before I jump into that, I want us to take a look at, we did an interview with our kids, with our young adults, our millennials and the younger, the high schoolers and the college and just out of college. And I want you to take a look at what they had to say about technology and relationships. I feel like this is kind of piggybacking, but I just feel like likes are like a like a tangible like you can actually see it like a way of val like it's a uh, it's like validation instant validation you can see it right there this is how many people like you said how many people mess with me how many people think I look look good or whatever and so just like seeing that number it's like it allows you to kind of quantify it and I think people just get too caught up in that I mean I myself am guilty of that too and I think that 
um, that's kind of what led to like taking breaks from social media because I think that um, it allows you to like, re just like really look at the situation and think about your own self worth. Simply, no. You can say there's a point where you're gonna feel like you're at the, your highest, but if you get more, that's cool too. Like it's even better. And there's yeah, that's pretty much it. Say you get like for Snapchat, you get 400. Let's say I get 400, man, I feel at my best right now. But let me tell you something. If my if it's my birthday and I get 625, that's even better. I'm cool. I'm really cool with that. I was at the Lions game, but I'm subscribed um, to, because I got to pay for this thing on Facebook where you can watch like NFL games live, because I was getting money. And so, so I was watching it, and I was at the Lions game at the same time. But I could have been watching the Lions game, but I was watching the game on my phone while I was actually there. And uh, I was supposed to be talking to my friends, because we usually talk about like the different plays and stuff. I was actually texting on my phone and you know, what was going on, and watching the game instead of, he was literally next to me. It was so weird. But it was like I needed to have my eyes glued on the screen. I went to the fireworks on the 4th of July and I was really mad at myself when I left because the majority of the time those fireworks were going off, I was like this. And then I got home and I was watching it through my phone. I'm like, yeah, but it probably looked a lot better looking at it live. But I'm staring at trying to make sure I get the right picture and all the fireworks are in it. And I completely missed the experience of actually seeing them in front of my face. For being honest, listen, we're laughing at them, but the truth is, is we do the same thing. We have found ourselves next to somebody or somebody's downstairs and we're on the second floor and we text them. Instead of doing the ghetto thing, hey! <laughs> we, we find ourselves at events, and instead of watching the events, we have our screen the whole time videoing it. And then we get home, and we wonder, oh, man, that would have probably been better if I just watched it. We find ourselves at movie. Oh, my God. This is a pet peeve of mine, too. Jokers be, how do you pay so much money for a movie and then go up there and, and you're just, mm, okay, this doesn't really look like a good, you know, what you got, what I'm saying. The whole time, we miss the experience. I can remember when I was little, it was an experience to go to a movie. All of this is, it's eroding our relationships. And we can hear it in our kids, but the truth is our kids are a reflection of us. And so we have to talk about, so how, what do we do? If our relationships are eroding away, if we're not, if we don't have these genuine relationships anymore, if we're losing some of that, what do we do? And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about what can we do to get back those genuine, meaningful relationships. And we're going to do three things. I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to first talk about the impact of technology. I want to just look at raw data, studies and data. Because it's one thing for me to say something's messed up, but then when you see the numbers, you're like, wait a minute. So I just literally want to look at numbers because we need to see what is going on. And then what I want to do is for some of us, we have probably never even seen a meaningful relationship, sadly. And so I want to give an example. I want to take a look at Jesus and show what does a meaningful relationship look like, right? And then I want to move from that to talk about how can we have that because you're going to want it. When you see it, you're going to say, that's what I need. And so I want to move through that. I want to look at the impact. I want to look at an example of how it should be, look like, and then I want to talk about how we can do it, okay? But before I do that, let me just pray. Father, I am overwhelmed with hearing that pastor say that people think that the Holy Trinity has nothing to do with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord. Help us. Bring us back to you. I just pray today that you would be amongst us, that you would speak to us, Lord. And, and technology is not the devil. It's a great tool, but you would help us to understand that it is just a tool, that it is not a God, and that we need to learn how to use it appropriately. So bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So I'm going to spend about five minutes now, and I just really want to show you the impact studies that talk about our relationships and what is happening because of technology. And the first study, I actually talked about about six months ago in a sermon, and I really didn't get to go where I wanted to because the sermon dictated that I didn't talk about social media. But the first study was done basically in 1989. 1989, 1990, 91. And at that point, they were trying to figure out how many meaningful relationships we have. The average person at that time had six meaningful relationships. Let me tell you what I mean by meaningful, because the whole idea of meaningful has changed, too. I'm talking about when you are down and out and you got a flat at 3 in the morning, they're getting up and coming to see you. When stuff jumps off and you find yourself had done something that you shouldn't and you're in jail, they come to get you. When you are... At your worst, and they see it, they stay. You, you hear me? That no matter what is going on, they are there for you. That whether you follow them or not, you're friends. See, in 1990 and 1989, we had six of those kind of relationships that we could depend on, people that would always be there for this. We knew we could call. They would do whatever we needed. They would give us some money for bills. They would pick us up if we were, they would cry with us. They would laugh with us. Today, the study says that 75% of Americans have two. And 25% can't even recognize one in their life. They have zero. Now, what makes that so crazy, what makes that even crazier, so not only have we gone from six to two and possibly zero, here's what's crazy. Let me read you some more stats. The average American has 328 Facebook friends. Only two or zero meaningful. The average American who's on Instagram has 843 followers. Maybe two meaningful relationships. The average person on Twitter has over 100 followers, but can't find more than two people who would show up for them. And when you add all these up together, all of this social media, you find it's 100, it's 1,161 people that you are having some kind of connection with, but won't show up when it goes down. We are losing our meaningful relationships. And here's the thing, when you have shallow relationships, you find that you feel disconnected from that person. So a lot of these people on Facebook, you don't really even know. You feel disconnected from their life, you don't really even care. So you feel disconnected from people, you feel empty, you feel lonely, and you feel chained to this technology. Wow. I had a girl when I was... Um, in science, when I was a teacher in science, and I had to pull her phone because she was texting. And she literally bust out crying. Like, she wept like, I, I thought she had lost her grandfather, to be honest with you. She wept in such a way that I, I, it, I can't even forget it. it was, it's burnt into my memory. She wept like she lost somebody. See, for some of us, we don't even know what a meaningful relationship looks like anymore, except for with our phone. We find more meaning in spending time with our technology than we do with people. Albert Einstein says this. Now think about when Albert Einstein was alive. He, we didn't even have the internet and cell phones and, you know, all that good stuff. This is what he said back then. He said, it has become appallingly obvious that technology has exceeded our humanity. Back in the 50s and 40s. Are you serious? appallingly obvious. So something has to change. And I want this data just to sit on you, these studies just to sit on you for a minute as I start to move to the second thing that I want to talk about, which is what does a meaningful relationship look like? I'm going to pause for a moment and let those numbers sit on you. So I really believe that some of us don't even have a good example of what a meaningful relationship looks like nowadays. And so it's important for us to take a look at what it looks like. And we can find it with Jesus in the book of John, in chapter 13. Now let me give you some context before I read. 
these verses to you. Jesus was about to die. He knew he was about to die. He knew he was about to be betrayed. He knew he was about to, you know, get taken in, that he was going to get beaten, that he was going to be on trial and eventually get crucified. He knew that. He also knew that his disciples were about to go through some really hard stuff because not only were they going to lose their leader, they were going to be persecuted too. And so Jesus did probably actually what a lot of us would do when we know we're about to leave this earth. He spent his last moments with people he cared about. He spent time with the disciples. And so that's the context of this. Now let me read it to you. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the mill, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped the towel around his waist. And after he poured water into a basin, he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Can you believe this? He's about to die. And he's washing these dudes' feet. Now, I'm going to get into the whole washing part in a little bit, but I got to tell you, when I read this, I pause right there. A dude washing another dude's feet makes me pause a little bit. Because I already know you ain't touching my feet. <laughs> and here's what's even crazier. You have to understand that these jokers didn't take showers every day like we do. It might be once a week, every two weeks, and they walked around in sandals, not on cement, but dust. Can you imagine the hobbit feet these jokers had? <laughs> that was not in my manuscript, but I just had to say it, okay? Can you imagine? And I have to ask myself this on a serious note. What would cause somebody to show the dirtiest part of themselves to somebody else? What would cause somebody to be so vulnerable that they would show the worst part of themselves to somebody else? And the answer is simply this. These guys had spent meaningful time together. These guys, this wasn't the first time they had a meal together. This wasn't the second time they ate together. These guys had spent three and a half years together. These guys walked from city to city together. These guys did ministry together. These guys argued together. These guys problem solved together. These guys were persecuted together. These guys did almost everything together. They spent meaningful time, which means they had meaningful experiences, which means those relationships became meaningful. And because those relationships were meaningful, I'm not afraid to show you my worst part. I'm not afraid to let you touch my feet. That makes me ask another question. What are we doing with our time? What are we doing with our time? Because I know what they were doing with their time. Hmm. See, our relationships are much different today. And social media has allowed us just to click and make a friend. Click and tell somebody we like them. Click and just give them a view. Click and just follow them. But if we're honest with each other, with each other none of those clicks are meaningful. And because it's not meaningful time together, it's not a meaningful experience. And because it's not a meaningful experience, we don't have meaningful relationships. Harvard did two studies. And, and these are amazing. The, the data that came from these studies are amazing. Harvard wanted to find out how much time we spend, uh, the average human spends on screen time. Now, let me give you, because see, some of you say, I don't, I don't have a social media account. Screen time is not just what you do on social media. It could mean that you have your phone out and you're scrolling news. You hear me? Or you're, you're on a screen. You're on an iPad. You're on an iPhone. You're on a TV. You're on a laptop. Whatever the case may be, there's a screen in front of you. Because some of you will say, I, don't worry, I don't have a social media issue. But do you have a screen issue? Harvard says that the average American spends 10 hours a day. We sleep eight. Think about that now. 
We sleep eight, that leaves us 16, and maybe 17, let's even say 18 hours if you only sleep six. And out of those 18 hours, you spend 10 of them with a screen. <laughs> out of those 10 hours that you spend on a screen, Harvard says that 30 to 50% of that time is spent on a social media platform. Let me give you another number that blew my mind. Harvard said if you took all the people that are on Facebook today and you added up their time for just one day, the whole world who's on Facebook, it would add up to about 40,000 years of time. One day. That's what we're doing with our time. We are spending time with technology instead of people. And even the time we spend with people is not meaningful time. Because the truth is, if we can only muster two meaningful relationships, it means that we're not spending meaningful time, which means we're not having meaningful experiences, which means that we don't have meaningful relationships. And so we have these shallow relationships, and we have a lot of them. And these shallow relationships, let me say this again. They leave you feeling empty and lonely and chained to technology. Wow. You know what's an interesting thing? Let me give you another Harvard study. Harvard said that during the Depression time, they decided to follow about 270 people. They had gone through the Depression. And so some of those people are still alive. Most of them are dead, but some of them are still alive. And here's the study that they did. They, so they fo followed these people who were kids during the Depression or maybe even born in the Depression. And they said, we want to find out. We want to look at their life and see which one of them, which of these people who went through this devastating time will have a very happy and meaningful life. And so they did this study, and they've been following. The study's still going because there's still about four or five of them alive. And they said they found one thing that determined whether these people had a really meaningful, happy life or not the amount of meaningful relationships they had, period. Not money, not where they lived, not their job, meaningful relationships. That these people, as they started to die, and, 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 and Harvard was taking all this information and, and, and even talked to them about how happy they were. They felt like, the ones that felt like they had a fulfilling life on their deathbed were the ones with the most meaningful relationships. Now, as a pastor, I've had the honor. i, I got to say, it's an honor to be able to go to somebody's funeral and, and, and hear their life story. And I'm going to tell you something. What I, and I've been to six. And, we need, and I even want to be aware of, 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 of Pastor John Weidman because he's right now with his family and his mom passed and the funeral's tomorrow. Yeah. Let me tell you what I have heard over and over and over again at each funeral. I don't hear anybody talking about the post that person made. I don't hear anybody talking about a Facebook account. I don't hear anybody talking about a Twitter account. I hear two things. The experience is shared and they wish they had more time with that person. That's what you hear every time. And the question is, is when I'm on my deathbed, Will I be able to say I had a meaningful life? Will you? Will people miss you? Will all they know you by is the things you post? By the Twitter? How many meaningful relationships we have is directly connected to the meaningful time that we spend? So we must think about that. Here's the second thing that we see that Jesus and his relationship with his disciples that help us understand what a meaningful relationship looked like. So he eats with them. He washes their feet. Again, you have to remember this whole thing about washing feet. People didn't have their wash. Their, their feet were only washed by, like, their slaves back in the day. So you have to understand, for Jesus to take off his garment and get on his knees and wash his feet, he was taking a, a stance that none of us most likely would. He said, I know you follow me, but today I'm going to wash you. I'm going to serve you. To understand the impact of that on the disciples. He, wa he eats with them and he washes their feet. And then he goes on to tell him why. He says, guys, let me tell you why I did this. And it's found in the same chapter a little further down in verses 34 and 35. And he says, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. 
You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. Stop. He's saying, it's coming to an end. I'm dying. I'm leaving you. This time that we have together is almost over. But a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. You see, Jesus washed their feet and then he said, I, let me show you how I love. Let me show you how desperately I desire to pour my love out on you. Because the truth of it is, in just a hot moment, you're going to need that love. It's going to sustain you. It is what we actually run on. We don't run on likes. I hate to break the news to you. But we were made for love, not for likes. Yeah. We were made for love, not for likes. Likes won't sustain what they were about to go through. And then he says, look, I'm going to be gone in a hot minute, so you guys, now that I've filled you up with love, you need to pour that out on each other. You need to practice love, not practice clicking a like. Practice love on each other because that is what fuels you. That is what I made you for. I created you for love. And so it is the only thing that you can possibly run on. You see... Likes won't sacrifice their life for you. But God's love does. Likes won't protect you, even from itself. But God's love does. Life, likes, can't transform your life. But guess what? Say it with me. God's love does. Likes cannot deliver you from sin. But guess what? God's love does. Likes cannot give you eternal life, but guess what? God's love does. Life cannot bring, likes cannot bring purpose into your life, but guess what? God's love does. L likes cannot give you hope, but guess what? God's love does. And let me say one more. Likes won't wash your feet and see your dirtiest parts, but guess what? God's love does. I'm about to quit the sermon right now and pull this thing off. because How many of you know that's phenomenal? Just hearing that should fill you up. You and I were made for love, for God's love. And our relationships, because we were made for love, have to operate on love. And so we have to practice love. And that means, first of all, getting it from God, but then giving it, but then giving it out in our relationships. So many of us are wondering why our relationships are stalled. It's because you're using the wrong fuel. You're using likes when you should have been using love. Hmm. Practice love. Practice love. This is what Jesus did with them. He got down on his knees. He washed their feet. He lavished them in his love and said, love each other because you're going to need it. It will be the fuel source that will get you through what you're about to go through. So we know that a meaningful relationship, there's actually five things I could have talked about, but for time's sake, I talked about the two major. You got to spend meaningful time you got to put down the phone and spend some meaningful time. And here's the other thing is you got to understand that we need to practice love, that we operate on love. So now how can we do this, right? So, okay, Josh, that sounds great, and I don't have e even two meaningful relationships. How do I get from not having two to having at least two? Or how do I get from two to having four? Let me give you just two suggestions. Not even suggestions, things to think about. Here's the first one. Relinquish... Let go of superficial communication. See, it is so easy because here's why we do the superficial communication, because we can control it. See, it's easy for me to text you because now I don't have to spend time talking to you because you might be one of those fools that ramble on for an hour, and I really don't want to hear what you have to say. 
I, I, it sounds so bad, but how many you, how many you know there's that at least two or three people, you're like, not calling that joker. Do you just text them because you're like, I got to control the situation. You get on the phone with that person and you get older before you get off. You're like, I had two birthdays. This is, send me a few gifts. No, okay. I, <laughs> See, the problem is, is I've done this too. Mm. See, the thing of it is, is we need to stop texting and we need to start talking. And here's, let me tell you something as a pastor, one of the most amazing things. Is, yeah, sometimes people will talk to you for half an hour. Sometimes you talk for an hour. Here's what I've learned, is that when I'm talking with somebody, instead of texting them, I hear their heart. When I'm talking to somebody and said, text them, I feel they're hurt, and I hurt with them. And when they cry, I cry. And when they laugh, I laugh. You can't get that in a text. We have to stop texting and start talking. For me, one of the things, I'm going to be honest with you, as a pastor, is a lot of times when somebody's going through something, I say, I'm praying for you. And one of the things God's telling me to do is set, stop texting them and call them and actually pray for them. It'll mean more. We got to stop scrolling and start strolling. Jokers be, mm, let's just take a walk together. Can we do something together once in a while? And people always act like they're so busy. Everybody's busy nowadays with the crazy world we live in. I don't got no time for that. Can we stop scrolling and start strolling? Finding time for each other. Let's go get something to eat. Let's just go for a walk. Let's just talk. My, my, my former pastor, one of the things he loved to do is he, he would just talk, take people, guys, and he had two or three guys, and he did a win, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and he would meet them up at the river walk, and they would just walk together and talk and pray. Half an hour, 40 minutes, and then they would go on there with their day. Can we start finding actual face-to-face -face meeting time for each other? You know what's amazing is that this was important to God. In the Garden of Eden, guess what God did? Guess what the Bible says God did? He came down. He walked with him. You know how crazy that is? He didn't just speak from heaven like, good to see you today, Adam. See, you, you know, you did right with the lions. Good job. It was, you know, that was a good name for the lions. I'm with you, Adam. You know, we were like, good, that was cool. <laughs> he actually came down. Do you know what God the Son did? He came down. Emmanuel means with, God is with us. He came down and he lived with us and he walked with us and he talked with us and he cried with us and then he bled for us and he died for us. Here's the second thing. Once you've given up some, and look, let's be real. We're not all going to stop scrolling and texting and doing some of those things. I'm asking you to do less of it. Once we start doing that, when we do some face-to-face -face time with each other, okay, when we start doing that, so once we let go of superficial communication with people, let's have genuine encounters. See, we can say let's go hang out together, and then we both find ourselves on our phones. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We can say, let's go to the movies together. And me and Alicia were at the movies the other week, and these two young girls came in. I was like, oh, here we go. And they sat next to us. And they were like, girl, you don't even know. And they are like, click, 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 click. I was like, oh, I'm going to slap a fool. I'm going to lose my pastor card, Lord. Alan's going to fire me because they're going to have it on Facebook. Look at that pastor trip. Let me tell you what's amazing, though. They're like, girl, I was like, oh. The movie hit, they put their phone away and watched it. I was like, that's what I'm talking about. They actually engaged in the movie together. See, most of us, we will actually spend time with people, but we have to have our phone there with us. Y'all know what I'm talking about? 
When we're eating dinner, when you go to a restaurant, you see the whole family on their devices, and the only time they engage each other, say, look at that, that was, kind of, that was a good one. Isn't it? When we get into meetings, I'm, I'm so guilty of this, and I, I got to really work on this. When we get into meeting, when I get into meeting, one thing I like to do is take my phone out and put it right on the table. <laughs> Y'all know why, don't you? You know how disrespectful that is to that person? It's really saying, I kind of want to hear you, but just in, if something pops off. And don't let that thing buzz. Wait a minute, player, wait a minute. Let me check this out real quick. Girl, for real? I'm, I'm hugging this phone right now. This is not healthy. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Turn this thing off and engage. Listen, laugh, cry. When they ask a question, actually answer the question because you heard. Engage. I'm going to ask the band to come up and I'm going to close out. But here's the thing I want us to think. As I'm closing out, I want you to think over your life. And I want you to ask yourself this question. The reason why I wore this and I kept talking about it is because the truth is, is some of us are in chains to social media. Some of us are in chains to our technology. We can't go anywhere without it. We have to always be looking at the screen. And maybe it's not the phone, and maybe it's your television. You spend hours on the television. And maybe it's not that, but it's something else. Some screen time of some sort. And the thing is, is that this is not a bad thing. It's a great tool. But we are supposed to be masters of it and not slaves to it. And so here's what I want you to do this week. Three things, and I'll close. Make a goal this week to talk to three people that you usually text. Instead of texting them, just pick up the phone and say, you know what, I'm going to call this person and talk to them. And, and look, I know there's some people who are long-winded. Just say, look, I got about 15 minutes, 10 minutes, I got to get back to work, but I, I just, I felt like I should call you and talk to you. When you're with somebody, don't do this. Don't pull the phone out and set, just turn it off and put it in your back pocket. Turn off the device and spend time with that person this week. One time this week when you're with somebody, don't pull this thing out. Turn it off. And literally fully engage that person in a shared experience. And then finally, practice love. Right? Do. Here's the thing. is A lot of us think love is a feeling and it's not. It's an action. Practice love. Lavish on those people that you care about love. Do things for them that show love. And I can promise you that your meaningful relationships will go from zero to two or two to four or four to six or six to eight. And like that Harvard study said, at the end of your life, you'll say, I had a meaningful life because I had meaningful relationships. <laughs>